Uh, hello, welcome. Um, my name is Jay Hendrickson. I'm the product manager for Hewlett Packard. And this is Steve Collins. He's the development manager at Hewlett Packard. And we're going to talk about hardware at a software conference. <laughs> Are we in the right place? I don't think so. I don't think so either. Um, so uh, this is about designing the hardware stack for your first OpenStack private cloud. And, and it, uh, OpenStack runs on all kinds of hardware. And so some people might ask, what's hardware got to do with it? And um, a lot. There, we, we don't have software-defined hardware yet. So somewhere underneath everything is, is hardware. And so we're going to talk today about um, designing your first OpenStack private cloud. So let me ask folks in the audience, how many people in here are using, well, have, have deployed a production OpenStack private cloud? Running in production. Excellent. Ten. That's three times as many as we're in Vancouver. So that, that's good. We're, we're getting up there. Um, for the rest of you, this is about actually going through and deploying the, uh, a, a private cloud. So um, I, I kind of like this quote because Albert Einstein was a pretty smart guy. And uh, everything should be simple as possible, but not simpler. The, the interesting thing is Einstein also had this theory of relativity, and, and so OpenStack is, uh, we're going to try to make this relatively uh, simple, um, but, but you all know that OpenStack, um, deploying and maintaining OpenStack uh, cloud I is not simple. So we're going to try to make it simpler. Um, how many folks in here enjoy 30 to 50 slide slide presentations over the course of like an hour. Excellent. <laughs> Nobody does. So here's what we have for you. Um, I, I like, I, I hate PowerPoint, whoever invented it. Um, I, I would personally like to just break their knees, but um, we have, um, we're going to show seven slides. Uh, not, not counting this one that's showing here. I'll tell you when we can start counting. Uh, so um, uh, first there's going to be some marketing kinds of fluff, so just don't throw anything at me. I just have to get it out of, the, get it out of my system. And then Steve is going to talk to you about the real meat of the, uh, of the presentation. So um, we're first going to talk about um, the case for a private cloud. Um, we all probably know, but I always like to sort of level set everything and then talk about what your plan might be before we get into the, to the meat, um, and then summary of the best practices. So uh, one of the reasons why I don't like slide presentations is you put up a slide like this, and then people are either listening to you talk or they're reading the slide, but you can't do both. So I'm going to let it sit there for a few seconds. All right, you've read it? OK. Um, and you get these slides at the end, right? So, so what I'm going to talk about is really what's on this slide, so you can, you can listen to me. Um, the emergence of the internal service provider. So um, data centers, you know, OpenStack, cloud, th those aren't going to take over everything, and there won't be anything else. We're still going to have bare metal stuff running. There's still going to be SAP HANA deployments that just don't run on OpenStack or don't run on a private cloud, they run on just bare metal. So, um, but th and then we heard today um, Erica talking about how if you don't have your own cloud uh, in your organization, there will, people who, there will be people who go outside the organization and use a public cloud. Um, if you can think about SharePoints in our own organization versus getting Dropbox or something like that uh, with Google, you just go on, go on the web. And if you want more space, you throw out a credit card and presto, you have it, versus getting a share space in your own organization, or for that matter, getting an email address in your own organization versus getting it from Gmail or, or Hotmail or, or fill-in-the-blank um, provider. So um, there's this whole gamut of 
applications and where they land. And what I want to talk about today is, is, the, is the private cloud and um, the, the need for it. So there's, there's a lot of folks who talk about security and performance and compliance as main reasons for wanting a private cloud. Uh, I, I really like to talk about compliance of so hospitals and you know sensitive data that you that you want within your four walls um, and and being able to create a private cloud where people can get to those resources as quickly as they can get to uh, applications and or data on a, on a public cloud so that's what we're going to talk about today and and where the uh, the internal service provider sits so um, without further ado let's talk about um, what your plan is for for building a private cloud so the first the first thing is uh, picking an OpenStack distribution. So um, right before I came in here, I was in my uh, hotel room, and I went to OpenStack.org, and I went to the OpenStack distributions, and there's 27. So, um, well, one, you can, you can do it yourself, right? You can go to OpenStack.org, and you can start grabbing all the, all the pieces and patch them all together yourself, and six months later, you might have something that's actually running. Or you can go to an OpenStack um, distributor. Uh, I work for Hewlett Packard, so we have one, HP Helion OpenStack. Um, Red Hat has one, SUSE has one, Canonical has one, Mirantis has one. My dog has, has one. It's not, it's not listed uh, on OpenStack.org, but, but, but he has one. He does. <laughs> Okay. So anyway, so you, you pick an OpenStack distribution. And then uh, you start thinking, okay, this is my first one. Uh, um, I, I, you know, I just, do I just uh, gather up a bunch of laptops and grab some old hardware that's laying around and just pour it all on top of it? Or is there, is, you know, do I think about it? And if we don't think about it, then oh, it's just, hard, it's just hardware, don't worry about it, just throw it on there. But when you get right down to it and you start asking these questions of what OpenStack distribution did I choose, what's the control plane, what I'm going to use for storage, all of these kinds of questions, next thing you know, somewhere in there, it has to land on hardware. So we start thinking about that. Um, the big one. Expect the workloads to change. So when you're building a private cloud, uh, you're, you're probably looking at situations where people have not, your users have not been utilizing a cloud. And so let, let's think about developers a, as an example. So typical dev test uh, scenario is developer writes some code, compiles it, builds it, throws it over the fence to QA, QA takes it, they test it, they run some tests on it, the bug reports come back, the developer starts fixing bugs. Um, that takes time, especially if they're building cloud native applications or applications that require a lot of testing. That time frame can last weeks before they get reports back. So the behavior is, well, let me get this next few lines of code in before I send it and compile it and send it over to QA because then I'm going to be working on something else while they're doing all their thing and setting up their hardware and doing all this. So by the time it gets back to them, it's been six weeks, and they're going, I don't even know if I wrote that code. Uh, maybe Diane wrote that code, right? And Diane since left the company. I don't know. But the, the point is that that time frame shrinks very rapidly once you go to a cloud. So the behaviors change. How, much, how many lines of code I write before I toss it over the fence changes. There's lots of things that are going to change. So your workloads, the behavior in the organization is going to change when you can get resources like that versus taking time. And, and that's important when you're choosing your hardware. Um, you can expect to scale up and out. You're going to build your first private cloud. You're going to put it into some type of production. It'll be small, but you're not running OpenStack as a private cloud for six users, right? You're, you're, going, to, you're going to scale it up, and you're going to scale it out. And so you need to expect that that's going to happen. All you have to do is get this proof of concept done, get some folks using it. 
the next thing you know, your CIO is going to be throwing money at you to build out this cloud. That's how it works. Um, we have data that shows that. We have customers that do that. Um, you want to mitigate, mitigate risk. And what I mean by that is uh, you're going to build your cloud, you're going to put together uh, a rack full of servers that, that is going to run a, a, a private cloud, and, and it's going to be expensive. I mean, it, it's easy to build a little tiny proof of concept that, ooh, I, I, you know, I, I put this little thing together and I, I show that OpenStack works and everything, but I can't actually use it in production, right? To build something that's going to be in production is going to take some money, half a million bucks, somewhere in that neighborhood, maybe less, but somewhere in that neighborhood. So to, to put your badge on the, on the desk of the CIO and say, I need a half a million dollars to build a private cloud, uh, you want to kind of mitigate some of that risk. You might want to start thinking about using hardware that is extremely reliable, robust, flexible, and um, easily redeployable. So something to think about. And then finally, how much time do you have? So uh, you can spend weeks and months uh, thinking about what hardware am I going to use. OK, I'm going to use this OpenStack distribution. Uh, what, what hardware am I going to use for the uh, management layer? What hardware am I going to use for the compute nodes? What hardware am I going to use for, for object storage, for block storage? What network switches am I going to use? All of these types of questions. Where do I think it might scale? What workloads might change? Where, you can start thinking about all of this kind of stuff. Or you can listen to Steve, who's about to tell you uh, what we did and some of the reasons why. So without further ado, let's get to the big fancy table. All right. So like Jay said, there's a lot. There's these slides with a lot of information on them. And you can either listen to me or look at the slides. So I'm going to give you a second to look in that. And then I'm going to talk through the various points or take pictures like a lot of people seem to do. <clears throat> so I'm going to go through three kind of usage scenarios, three use cases that we, um, that we had and the various hardware choices we made and why. <clears throat> so if you look at the various uh, distributions that are out there, there's a lot of things they have in common. For example, one of the things that they, they tend to have in common is there is a deployment host. You know, on this slide, we call it the seed cloud host. And this particular example is for Helion OpenStack version 1.1. But other distributions are very similar. So you'll, if, if you're familiar with other distributions, you should be able to kind of tie in some, some similarities there. So you've got a deployer node, which generally doesn't require a lot of resources. Um, you know, it may do things like, you know, in this case, it's providing DHCP services. Um, it's deploying some of the initial nodes. In this case, it's just applying a single node, the under cloud controller. But it's got to be just, you know, a basic server, not a whole lot of resources, which in this case is why we chose, you know, just a six core, 32 gigs of memory, and a mirrored um, two terabyte boot drive. And that's really all you need. You know, there are, in fact, there are cases where people use a laptop for this kind of functionality, and that, that can work as well. If it's something that you're going to want to keep in production long term, you probably want something other than a laptop. In this case, then, there is an undercloud controller, which in the Helion OpenStack 1.1 scenario is used to deploy the rest of the overcloud. So it deploys the overcloud controller, compute, Swift, and Cinder, you know, all our storage pieces. And so it needs a little bit more um, power, but not a whole lot, which is why in this case we choose a two by six core processor, 64 gig of memory. And in this case, faster drives. So that's one thing that's actually a big consideration with each of the nodes and the role that they play is what kind of drives you want in there. Do they, do they need to be, you know, are you focused on speed, which in this case we are, which is why we, we chose 15K drives, or is capacity the, really the driver, in which case you'd want slower drives that can give you higher capacity, um, which, you know, I think now we have eight, eight, uh, eight terabyte drives and 7.2K speeds. Um, in this case, we're using six terabyte drives. Um, <coughs> Then you look at the overcloud controller. So this is the guy, you know, and, and most distributions will have something like a controller or something called something like that. And in a lot of cases, it'll be multiples. In this case, there's three. These are the nodes that are running the majority, if not all, of the OpenStack services. So they take a big load from uh, processing power as well as from I.O. So you can see in this case, we're using two, two by 12 core processors, um, 64 gig of memory again, and again, fast drives. 
And I should have mentioned also, you know, uh, with your OS and, uh, you know, other volumes, you also want to take into account what type of RAID you want to, uh, to use. So I think I mentioned in, this, in the case of the seed, he's seed host, we're just using RAID 1. It's just a mere drive. You don't need anything, anything real fancy. In the case of the undercloud controller and overcloud, we want a little bit better performance. In our case, we chose RAID 10 for those nodes. So in, in actual capacity there, we've got uh, 1.2 terabytes for, for each of those cases. 1.2 terabytes use, uh, usable storage. Um, next on the list is a compute host. It says four there. That's just that's, that's how many we had in this reference architecture. Obviously, you can have as many compute hosts as you want. They're all the same. In our case, we're using uh, DL360s, which I should have mentioned also. All these up to this point are 360s in our case, which is... Um, you know, nice from a deployment standpoint and a uh, density standpoint because they're one-use servers. So you can get all the functionality you need for all of those roles in just a, a single U of Rackspace. For the compute node, you know, you need to look at what types of workloads you think you're going to run. And as Jay mentioned, that changes. So that's really tough. It's tough to know from the outset. So you kind of have to make a best guess. And then as you, you know, as your usage changes, as you learn what you're really doing with the cloud, you're going to have to adjust a little bit. So you know, maybe you start out with you know, these first four nodes and they're 18 core like we have in this case, and maybe you find out that you know, uh, either memory is more your limiting, your limiting item or storage, and so you have to adjust a little bit. In this case, as a good starting point, we used you know, maximum number of cores. So we've got 18 cores um, by two, um, which gives you uh, 72, um, 72 cores, 72 virtual CPUs. Um, with 256 gigs of memory. And then on the storage side, we're using kind of, you know, not the fastest drives, but not slow either. So drive speed is important in this case as well. So, you know, you probably don't want to go with 7.2K drives, but you probably also don't need 15K drives. And so a consideration there is, you know, at least as at the time we, we did this reference architecture, 10K drives were roughly half the price of 15K drives. And if you look at the I.O. performance, yeah, um, that's, that's a pretty good sweet spot for those compute nodes. A good rule of thumb here is when you look at the ratio of your ephemeral storage to your um, memory, you want about a 10 to 1 ratio, which is what we have here. We got 256 gigs of memory and roughly 2.4 terabytes of storage because these are also uh, RAID 10. All right. Okay, so next up we have the two, uh, our two storage nodes. So we've got Swift for our uh, object storage and then Cinder for block. Um, it, for those nodes, we're using DL380s. So higher capacity, really the, the big driver for using the 380s there is to be able to put more storage in those boxes. So they, they can hold, you know, in, the, in this case, you can hold was it 26 small form factor drives or 15 large form factor drives. In the case of Swift, we're using... Uh, large form factor because we're really after capacity in that case. You know, they don't have to be super fast drives. We just want as much capacity as we can get in there. So we're using six terabyte drives in here. Um, you can see I'm also listing two by 600 gigabytes. That's the OS. Um, those are the OS drives. So those are faster. Those are running the OS and the, and the Swift uh, services. Um, but the rest of the storage drives are just six terabyte, 7.2K drives. In the case of Cinder, um, you know, here again, you, you got to think in, think about your storage, and in this case, you do want a little bit faster drives, which is why we're choosing kind of that sweet spot of 10k drives. Uh, in that case, um, this uh, our, our implementation of Cinder here uses our VSA cluster, and which also doesn't require a whole lot of compute power, which is why you know we only have a six-core processor in there. It, it really doesn't need a whole lot. So, you, know, you could. Uh, as you can see here, you could kind of max everything out. You could put, you know, 12 core, 14 core, 18 core, and everything, but you're, you know, you're overspending. Or you could make the opposite mistake and just go single six core, and then you, you're going to have problems in some cases. So it does take some some study, some research, and research, and kind of knowing how these things play with each other to to really, uh, you know, figure this out, or some some real world experience. <coughs> just to touch a little bit on the networking side. Um, you know, the various distributions, they're all a little bit different, but in general, you're going to have an IPMI type network that's used for powering the servers on and off, um, which you're fine with just a one gig network. No problem there. 
for the rest of the networking functions, you probably want at least a single 10 gig. Um, there are cases where you can pair them up. Um, you know, where you have a bonded pair, so you can get 20 gig or more. Um, in this case, we're using a 40 gig uh, or 10 gig network with a, a 40 gig uh, or a 40 port switch that uses uh, 10 gig ports, and that's used for the rest of the uh, the rest of the network functions in OpenStack. So before I go on to the other two, any questions about this particular scenario? Yeah, here I'm going to pass around the mic so they can hear it. Mr. Rao, 15K says, why SSDs have not been used at all? Yeah, so SSDs, that's a good question. Um, so uh, obviously a big driver is cost, and the cost of SSDs is significantly more than, than the spinning media. As you'll see in a, in a, in a follow-on scenario, we did use SSDs. So there are cases where you want to use them. Again, this is kind of from if you're starting out and you don't really know where you need that, you need to put that extra expense, you probably are okay starting without it. And then you can see, you know, it doesn't make sense for me to use SSDs in some of my compute nodes. It doesn't make sense to use SSDs as a front end for some of the Swift functionality, which is what we did in, a, in, a, in another uh, reference architecture. Because you do get a performance gain if you use SSDs for your Swift account and container functionality. So that is an option. I was talking only about the under cloud and the over cloud container, not the others. To use SSDs for those? Only, yeah, for SSDs. Because you don't, you don't need that kind of performance on those nodes. You'd be spending money you just don't need to spend. They don't, the, the drives don't need to be that fast. 15 KSS are also trying to use SSDs. Yeah, but not, not like an SSD. So you, I mean, you can still have to find that right what the right spot is. So, I mean, the good thing, again, Jay kind of alluded to this, but, you know, these are all just kind of basic servers that can be used for a lot of different things. So what you could, I mean, what you may find is, so, so you start out with these 15K drives, and maybe in your case you find out, I really need SSDs in there, pull those 600 gig drives out, and they can be used for, you know, some of the other nodes. So we try, actually tried to design this so that everything wasn't super, super unique. I mean, you want to kind of tailor the specs for each node so that it fits, but you don't want them to be so kind of out in left field that they, you know, the, the hardware can't be used for anything else. Because as Jay mentioned, things will kind of migrate over time. You will change, your needs will change, and you want to kind of move things around. Any other questions on this one? Yeah. I'm going to try to get a mic back to you. Are there anyone using the Apollo systems for hyperconvert solutions? So yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a very, can you hear me? Okay, that's a very good question. And the, the, so uh, you can, that, that's the simple answer, you can. Uh, we're talking about um, a, a configuration in this case where, where what we were thinking was, okay, this is your first OpenStack private cloud. We wanted to keep the architecture of the hardware as similar as we could. So we used these DL360s and 380s for several reasons. First, uh, they, they have the same architecture, so same BIOS, same drivers, um, it's, the, it's the same architecture, same chipsets, all, all of that stuff. Um, the second thing is uh, the DL360 and 380 are on everybody's standards list, whereas the Apollo may not be. Um, and then the third question, I mean, the third reason is um, you are taking a risk when you set up uh, y your first OpenStack private cloud. So you're, you're going to your CIO and you're saying, I want to spend a half a million dollars and I want to build a private cloud. And your CIO is thinking, half a million, really? Okay, That's, we, we can do that. And then the sweet spot is you say, um, look, boss, um, if, if this private cloud, if something goes wrong and, and it doesn't work, we have a rack full of DL360s and 380s. I mean, how bad can that be? You're probably going to buy them anyway. Yes? No? It's the most popular server on the planet. <laughs> of course. <laughs> All right. Let's go through the next one. And you'll see, I'm not going to talk to every single one of these because you'll see there's a lot of similarities. In fact, the first, uh, I think, three items on there are exactly the same as what we saw in the last use case. But this one in particular is for the SUSE distribution. And again, you've got kind of the similar 
similar concept where you've got a deployment server, you've got control nodes, and you've got compute. And you know the sweet spot for all of those in this uh, use case is exactly the same as the last one we talked about. A difference here is the storage. You know, in, in the case of SUSE OpenStack Cloud, they're using Ceph instead of uh, Swift and Cinder. And so the, the requirements are a little bit different, but you see they're, they're, are, they're actually pretty similar. Um, again, a 2 by 12 core uh, processor, 64 gigs of um, memory, and the drive configuration, I'm trying to remember, I think this, one, this one's a little bit different. So again, two 600 gig drives for the OS, they're mirrored, and then 13 6 terabyte drives for your storage. Everything else is, is pretty common. In the case of networking, there is a little bit difference here because, um, as I mentioned before, there are cases where you can bond the network ports, and this is the case with SUSE, that they're able to, uh, to uh, bond their network ports, and so they, they use a few more ports than, uh, or double, double the 10 gig ports as in the last case. Questions on this one? All right. And our third scenario is for Helan OpenStack 2.0, soon to be released. There are some differences here because the, the actual configuration is a little bit different. Um, as you'll, if you remember on the 1.1 scenario, we had, we had a seed node, we had an undercloud, um, then we had the controllers and we had separate Swift nodes. The difference here is there is a deployer node which is similar to that seed node. It's a little bit different, but it's similar. The controller is combined with Swift, so the Swift functionality in this scenario is on those same controller nodes, and there is no under cloud node at all. <coughs> so if you look at this, the deployer specs are exactly the same as they were before, a six core processor, um, mirrored two terabyte drives to run the OS. It doesn't really need a whole lot of functionality or a whole lot of performance to do its job. Um, that's really all it needs. Now in the case of the uh, controller and Swift nodes, so this has taken a lot of, th this needs a lot of horsepower, right? So it's running all the OpenStack services, including Swift, is doing the Swift proxy and container as well as the object functionality. So you need to make sure you size this one right. Here we've, we're going with a 12 core processor, 64 gigs of memory. I should mention here, as you see up at the top, this is proposed. So this is kind of a, this is a work in progress, but here's what it's looking like right now and, and uh, is, is being proven out in our labs right now. And then we've got, again, a pair of uh, fast 600 gig drives for the OS and six terabyte drives for the object. Um, a difference that's not mentioned on here is out of those, uh, which actually is a, a little bit, in, well, it is incorrect here. What we're looking at right now is not 13 six terabyte drives for um, object. We're actually looking at 11 six terabyte drives and then two drives um, of SSD for the container and uh, account nodes. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you do see a performance gain when you do that. So we're, we're, on, we're at the point right now we're measuring what that performance gain is to kind of do the cost performance trade-off, but uh, it's looking good so far. But I mean, th so those are the things you have to kind of keep in, in, in mind and you know, sometimes it just takes experimentation and, and uh, experience to figure out what really works best. Uh, let's see, let me get this mic to the back. So when you talk about performance gains, actually, I would assume that you're measuring this stuff. So is there a particular suite that you are using, a particular test bed, is it in GitHub, pretty much? Yeah, I mean, there, there's a variety of there's a variety of tools that uh, we're using, and honestly, I can't remember the names of all of them. I've got some engineers that are doing it. I think they're, I mean, Rally, I think, has some tools in it. Uh, there, I mean, there's a variety of tools, I think, that are, that are part of the OpenStack distro, as well as some stuff that we've, we've made in-house to measure. Um, throughput as well as kind of functionality between the various services and uh, you know uh, an IO performance and those kind of things so I mean afterwards I can I can track down the exact details for you if you want and I can I can get that to you um, compute specs exactly the same as before so a 360 server 18 cores 256 gigs of memory um, oh I lied it's not exactly the same because in the Helion OpenStack 2.0 case, they split the OS volume from the ephemeral storage, which was not the case in 1.1. So in this case, you've got, you've got a mirrored pair of 1.2 terabyte drives for the OS, and then you've got four drives, 1.2 terabytes RAID 10 
for your ephemeral storage, which keeps that 10 to 1 ratio again, right? Because you've got, <coughs> you've got four 1.2s as RAID 10, which gives you 2.4 terabytes usable storage. In the 1.1 case, which is all combined, the OS and the ephemeral storage all in the same drives, which is why we, we only had four of them. And then Cinder. Cinder specs are exactly the same as in 1.1. That seems to be a uh, you know, good sweet spot. Doesn't need a whole lot of processing, processing power, so six cores is fine. And then you know that sweet spot of the drives, 10K drives, um, 1.2 terabytes. And you know in that case, we're, we're actually starting out with, the, uh, with that box only half filled with storage. Um, it can hold uh, 26 drives. So you can get started with that much storage and then add drives to it as it grows. Yes? Does the 2.4 version still not support Chef? It does, Ceph. Support, it does support Ceph. Okay. Yes, so Ceph so is an option. Uh, still you don't uh, recommend that kind of a configuration? Well, it's not necessarily that we don't recommend it. It's just that for this, for the reference architecture that we did here, we're, we just chose to use uh, Swift and Cinder. Oh, I should probably. You want to run the mic? Yeah. Roughly, how many VMs are you uh, planning for per computer? <laughs> That's always no, the magic. <laughs> That's the magic question. Nobody <laughs> talks about VMs. Okay. <laughs> so here's the deal. It's it's real important to talk about yeah, the physical cores, it. and the uh, the physical cores and the amount of memory that you have in your in your uh, configuration. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, uh, those are all. Th those are all. <laughs> that, uh, yeah. Right. So, uh, so uh, it, you can run in in this configuration. You can run over 500 tiny VMs with four compute nodes. Now, uh, and 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 we have we have competitors who who will say that they can stand up X number of VMs on some small number of nodes. The catch here is, uh, are you really going to run 500 VMs through a 10 gig pipe? Uh, I mean, you 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 can you can, you, you okay? You bonded for 40, and you still have over 500 VMs. So the question the question you have to ask yourself is, what are the workloads, and and how much and how much bandwidth is each VM going to need? And and so. Uh, the outbound marketing people at HP just pounded on us and said, you can run 144 VMs on each one of these nodes. And I just kept shaking my head saying, I, I don't know how to, to actually justify that in terms of a real world experience. But that's a number, and it can be run if they're all really, really tiny. Now, now would you be doing that? I'd probably I'd not. Probably not. So the key here is to focus on, in, in my mind, is to focus on how much memory do you have, how many physical cores do you have, and how much bandwidth do you have, and then on top of all of that, what are the workloads that you're going to be running? So if you're running, you know, little, if if you're if you're running a, a VM that requires one whole physical core, you're never going to get to 500, right? So I mean that that question ha is is asked. You know, I mean, it's a it's a good question. Lots of yes. Yes. So, so uh, yeah. So uh, the the next slide that we show is going to be you know what this bait and switch thing was all about. Um, <laughs> well, so just to add another thing to that, so so if you kind of have an idea of what your workloads are going to be or what combination of VM flavors you're going to have, you, you've got a better starting point for figuring out what those ratios ought to be. Um, if I'm trying to remember what the number is, who remember, what's the, what's the sizes for a, for a uh, large VM, M dot large? I don't remember what those sizes are. I So I'm trying to remember it because uh, I mean actually we have a, we have a white paper that lists various scenarios in that in that large case I don't remember the number of VMs. I, I just remember yeah, in the large the, um, in the large case you end up with um, you actually hit your limit when you get to um, let's see in this scenario the disk space is actually your, your limiting factor so you'll hit that limit on disk space a little bit before you hit it on 
memory and you end up 1.4 oversubscribed on virtual CPUs or on CPUs. So I mean, so, so if you have those, if you know what your mix is and you can, you can run the numbers and figure it out and tweak things a little bit based on that, but that's, but that's kind of the, that's the analysis we did. And that's, that's also where that 10 to 1 ratio of, of storage to memory uh, also helps because that, that matches the, the uh, VM flavors. So it kind of keeps, keeps you balanced there. All right, any questions before uh, <laughs> Jay summarizes? Yeah. All right, here you go. So, uh, so what we've given here is a uh, uh, three, three different configurations, one for um, HOS 1.1, one for SUSE OpenStack Cloud, and one for the proposed um, HOS 2.0, which is coming out very, very, very soon. Um, and um, they're, they're not just reference architectures. Um, what we've done to help stand up uh, your first private cloud is to rack and stack and optimize all of this stuff and deliver um, a, a product like this so that um, it, now the reference architectures will have the build of materials in the, in the appendix and, and you would be able to look at that and go and buy um, all the cables and the racks and the power supplies and all of that stuff um, for, from any vendor that, that you would want or um, you could actually buy the product like this that, that would have it um, pretty much, I mean that's a, that's a very, very good representation of the of the um, Helion rack, which is the which is based on HOS 1.1, um, it'd be slightly different for the SUSE OpenStack Cloud and slightly different for HOS 2.0. Um, the nice thing about this is um, it's it's all cabled, optimized, it's it's tuned. Um, switch configurations are done in the factory. It's delivered to the data center, and then professional services teams come out and uh, and install OpenStack. Um, for you and and or with you, depending on how you want how you want to do that. A uh, couple of things about it. Um, first of all, it uh, I really kind of want to look on the right hand side there. So these barriers to adoption. So one of the things that that's changing, uh, and certainly when I asked the very first question of how many people are actually have actually deployed a production uh, OpenStack cloud, the first time we talked about this stuff a year ago. Um, I can't remember. There might have been one person in in the audience who who uh, who raised their hand and said that they had actually deployed. And and one of the questions that I then asked everybody else was, well, gosh, we have you know thousands and thousands of people coming to OpenStack Summit, and there's a big the big buzz, and it's the largest open source project um, in the world. Uh, why aren't why aren't there more OpenStack um, clouds uh, being run? And when I started asking people that, it was, well, um, it's complex and it's expensive. And so one of the nice things about this particular um, uh, box, if you will, this cloud in Iraq, is that it mitigates some of that complexity and some of the time to production. So uh, when we deployed our first I'm sorry, was there a question? Oh, is there a question? Okay. Uh, uh, when, when we deployed our first OpenStack private cloud um, it, at, a, at a customer site, uh, we, we, we found out after it was deployed and in production, we talked to the folks who did the installation, and the question was, how long does it take for a typical OpenStack deployment? And so, you have OpenStack engineers going into a data center and evaluating the hardware and installing a production running OpenStack. And the, the answer was it takes usually about three weeks, which is actually pretty fast. When this was deployed, the very first one off the factory floor delivered to the customer three days, up and running which is significantly faster. And so, again, when you're taking this risk of building your first pri private cloud, um, getting it up, get, getting your toys unwrapped and, and being able to play with them quickly is a good thing. 
Um, so, let's see, we're getting short on time here. Let's, let's go to the summary of best practices. So, um, again, I've, t I've, I've, I've talked about mitigating risk a lot. Um, use known, reliable hardware. Again, um, I'm not saying you have to use HP, um, although I work for HP, so full disclosure, it's always good to use, um, use our stuff. Um, but when you're building this first private cloud, you, you really don't want or can afford to have hardware issues during your learning experience of maintaining an OpenStack private cloud. Okay, it's, it's one thing to get it installed and deployed and then maintained. So hardware that is um, known, reliable, um, and easy to manage is, is, a, is a good thing. Uh, use similar architecture for your physical hosts. Um, as, as I mentioned before, not only are your workloads going to change, but the, the, as you scale out, you, you may want to use these servers um, for, di for different roles. And so to the extent that you have a similar architecture, it makes it easy to redeploy these boxes into to the roles that they might play. Um, perfect example is the change from our HOS 1.1 to our H HOS 2.0. We went from a triple O type of uh, deployment methodology to an Ansible-based uh, methodology, and we were able to reduce the number of nodes in the control plane. So for a customer who has HOS 1.1 and they want to migrate to HOS 2.0, they, they can now go from five nodes to, two no uh, to three nodes. And so the question might be, well, what do I do with those other two nodes? Well, they're DL 360s. Turn them into compute nodes, right? You, you could have gone with what Steve said and used a laptop for your seed node or some very, very small, um, not very powerful box. But then what do you do with it when you when you're, when, when OpenStack changes, and it will change, right? I mean, we're, we're going through a, a, a sea change. So uh, expect your, um, so, so use similar architecture. Um, expect workload variability. That is absolutely going to change. Uh, and when we developed this product, we talked to lots of customers, lots of partners. We talked to folks in public cloud. And one of the things that the folks in the public cloud said was, we have, we have customers who say, these are our workloads. This is what we want um, to be s stood up for us. And it, it was never right. It was never right. Their workloads changed. And so that will change. And so um, you want to have, at least at the front end, you want to have uh, hardware that can be either compute, as an example, be either a compute node or storage node, whether it be object store or block store. Um, plan to scale up and out. That's going to happen. You're, you're, you're not going to build a, a single rack private cloud and have it stay there. It's, it's going to scale out. Um, and then, of course, configure for high, high availability. So one of the things that we've seen is that the control plane is at least in this point of time, is going to stay at around three nodes so that you can, so that you can um, stay highly available. So you, you definitely want to start planning on that. So you, you know, you, the, the physical network switches, um, you want to think about what, what kinds of switching you're going to be using so that, so that you um, have the, the port um, numbers and the, and the uh, bandwidth. So I guess just, just one more point on that. So sure. we didn't talk a whole lot about the high availability, but you know, obviously when you start thinking about how that factors in. There are a lot of other things that kind of go into that and, and that, that will drive, such as if you really want a high availability, you're going to spread it across multiple racks, right, or multiple zones. You're going to split up your um, object storage, uh, you know, the same way, nodes in each rack, um, redundant switches, those kind of things, which we didn't go through here, but that is also part of the, the thought process you need to, you know, you need to put in up front. Or at least build that first rack and that initial deployment so that you know that you can get to that high availability um, scenario when you want to get there. So. Sorry, Jay. So, um, and just one more thing before I, um, before we, we close. Uh, uh, when we, when we um, began selling the, the, the Helion rack, uh, 
we we knew that the scale out would would happen over time. It would it would be based on um, how successful the deployment went and and how quickly the user um, was up and running. And one of the things that we found out that happened very very quickly is this particular customer, a very large uh, entertainment company on the west coast of of the United States. Uh, you've all heard of them, um, but they haven't given me permission yet to say their name. But let's just say that they. Uh, do a lot of media stuff. Um, they they went in. It was probably two or three months, maybe less than that, after their first rack to now they're at three racks, um, and so it's happening very very fast. And and I and I would expect that uh, that if your first private cloud is successful, it will expand very very quickly. So with that, uh, any questions? Run it back. You got it. <coughs> so you guys mentioned that um, you guys allow to repurpose different racks that you have in place. So my experience with the bigger thing, the biggest problem that I have is pretty much this discovery almost of like the uh, IPMI interfaces sort of things. Do you have any provision for that in your rack, or do you have a particular inventory set in place, fixed or something? Can you rediscover? Can I grow this rack on place, et cetera, et cetera? I didn't get all of that. Did you? Yeah, what was So for example, like you repurpose machines, right? So machines that used to be part of the a part of the control plane can be used for store of compute nodes or something or vice versa. Correct. Right. Uh, so I would assume that at a certain point if you run to run Ansible stuff, things like IPMA IPMI discovery and things like this will be easier if you have a knowledge of at least which MAC addresses exist, et cetera, and would to which part they belong, either to the data plane or to the control plane. Is that something that you have casted in place or do you have it a priori or yeah, right. N right now, that kind of functionality is not in place as part of I mean, as part of Hila and OpenStack. Gotcha. So, if yeah. for example, things like a particular network card has to be replaced or something, having a different MAC address, uh, would you accommodate for this? Uh, I don't know how that's done in Hila and OpenStack. Yeah. Honestly, gotcha. yeah. that's okay. a, that's a great question. I'll read more about this. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, that's a great question. Any other questions? All right. That's why we didn't do the Apollo on the first <laughs> on the first one because we wanted. Okay. But it doesn't mean that the Apollos are not supported. It just means that the Apollos are not in that reference architecture and in this product. Yeah. Right. In fact, there are there are there are use cases where the Apollo is great. There's certain absolutely where it is the perfect. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If if no. you're a if you're a, a Swift uh, object store, if those are your workloads. Oh, equally for compute. I mean, there's a yeah. version that oh, would yeah, be that, that's yeah. dense compute that would be perfect. I mean, just again, it kind of depends on if you know what your workload is and what you want to do. There's scenarios where those uh, those boxes are perfect for. Yeah. I I understand that HP bought some company. Then those are some kind of software to include with it Helium. That you never mentioned that something like. Uh, somewhere that will make it easier to like you include Apache and all those stuff and all script and everything in there. I I don't remember that name, but I think I HP know. bought that and I I thought you're gonna combine with this one, but you never mentioned it. It doesn't ring the bell. No, okay. it doesn't. <laughs> this I, is I, a this yeah this reference architecture is a pure Helion uh, product, so it's it's. It's OpenStack. I mean, it's it's OpenStack with our with our deployment wrapper over the top of it. But um, you can, I mean, obviously it's OpenStack, so you can dump all kinds of other tools and scripting um, utilities on top of it. But I'm I'm not really sure what you're. Okay, all right, I'll I'll find out. Does the HP networking hardware supports acceleration like RDMA? Which is beneficial for sender um, the, communications. The so in HOS 2.0, the 58, the 5930 switch does. Okay, and the hardware which is included in the DL 380 or 360s, the 10 gig cards, they all support it. Yeah, uh, so yep. that's a that's a great question. So in the in the base configuration, we we have um, straight Intel um, 10 gig NICs, 
But one of the nice things about this particular configuration is you can configure using different types of NICs in, in the boxes. So during, during the ordering process, you can say, well, we've standardized on this different NIC or we want to use, um, you know, maybe you want a low latency type of workloads. And so we, we use some, you know, very low latency uh, hardware in the, in the boxes. That's appreciated. Any other questions? Let's go to the booth crawl. Here you go. Thank you.